Father Mark White, thank you for being here with us. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Michael. All right. Well, you have, unfortunately, a story similar to many faithful priests trying to get their congregations to heaven. Why don't you just share that with the audience with us? Uh, well, I appreciate your giving me the opportunity to do so. Uh, I think we have in common an interest in Mr. James Grine, who um, you gave a chance to speak publicly here and organize the rally in Baltimore back in the fall of 2018. Mm -hmm. He and I um, have in common that we both received sacraments from Theodore McCarrick. He was baptized by uh, then Father McCarrick, who then proceeded to begin abusing him when he was 11 years old. Then I was ordained by Theodore McCarrick as a priest. And I took it upon myself that summer to use my blog as a place to collect stories about James and get, get the truth that he was getting out, um, out in, into the world. And you did that because you were motivated by the fact that you were like, oh my gosh, I was ordained a priest by this. Which, exactly. Human. Right, exactly. Yeah, and it, it, it moved me uh, when we learned the truth about, about McCarrick to reflect on my own ordination day, which was for me the happiest day of my life, a day of, of hope and, um, and real joy uh, that that day had come. But... To and what year was that? Uh, 2003. Okay, mm -hmm. so Cardinal McCarrick was Archbishop of Washington, oh, Washington D.C. at the time. At the time, right. exactly. And he, uh, but what, what ran through my mind was James might have been there or someone else of the dozens of people that McCarrick had uh, abused may very well have been at that mass mm -hmm. uh, with 3,000 people there at the Basilica of the Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, hundreds of priests, and there's the man who had poisoned their relationship with God, being at the center of the whole holy solemnity. Uh, and realizing that really changed my point of view on, on a lot of things. Um, and I'd had this blog that I'd been using to try to get the Word of God out uh, ever since 2008. That's when I started it. And so I think we wound up having another thing in common. I think at one point, uh, church militant received some kind of precept from a bishop yeah. uh, about how to do things. Uh, and, and I got one too. Uh, mm -hmm. And I have it here. I thought maybe I would, I would go ahead and read it. Sure, um, sure. Uh, this is from my bishop, who um, is a longtime associate of Theodore McCarrick. Uh, he issued this precept for me. Reverend Mark White is to cease from this moment in disseminating his opinions by means of any social media, in print, by audio or video, or any digital means. This includes any personal communications to and from his ordinary. Any previous posts are to be removed from all social media and the account is to be closed. In the exercise of his pastoral office, Father White is to refrain from all assertions against or judgments about the hierarchy of the church. Rather, he is to show the respect and obedience he promised at his ordination. Failure to do so in any of these matters will find Father White subject to additional penalties. And you have something in common with Donald Trump. <laughs> You're being censored. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's about the size of it. Yeah, yeah. being censored. What's right. your, uh, uh, just as a man, what's your, you know, guttural response to that? Yeah, I appreciate your asking. If, if I had been preaching heresy, if I had been like James Martin, leading people to defect from the faith. Um, I th then maybe this is something I would have to take as a just punishment, but that's not what I've been trying to do. Uh, I've been trying to deal with what I myself and my brother priests, the faithful people that were touched by this man's ministry. I mean, he or McCarrick ordained hundreds of priests and confirmed thousands of young people, uh, and we have all been profoundly betrayed. Uh, the whole the church in the United States has been betrayed. And I've been trying to deal with that as best I could. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, I wrote an open letter. When, when did that to, uh, notification from your bishop come? Uh, it originally, I received it in writing this past June. Okay, um, so a few months back. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. I thought I thought maybe I could read the uh, the open letter that I had written to Theodore McCarrick back in the summer of 2018. Sure. Um, which I think is kind of the beginning of the story that led eventually to this. And, um, and just so the audience is clear, what's the relationship between your bishop and Theodore McCarrick? Uh, when when McCarrick was Archbishop of Washington. Now Bishop Barry Nestout served as his secretary, his appointment secretary, mm -hmm. um, and then... He knew his comings and goings. Uh, yes, I think that's fair to say. All right, yeah. so he would have set appointments, et cetera, mm -hmm. all the... It's highly unlikely that he knew nothing of any of this. That seems unlikely given his closeness, his proximity on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis to then Cardinal McCarrick. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, when, I know you don't know, but I'm just, right. you, know, you have to posit the question. Sure, it, it's, yeah. You know. and, I, and I actually tried to defend Bishop Nestout from accusations that he did know um, when the news first came out in the summer of 2018. People asked me, since I was around then at the time, by, by the providence of God, we, we wound up in the same diocese. I was a priest of the Archdiocese of Washington, as was he. I had a dream of serving in a diocese where there was a greater need for priests, and so I transferred to the Diocese of Richmond in 2011. And wouldn't you know it, seven years later, uh, Barry Nestow becomes the bishop, becomes my bishop. And I never wanted to ha have anything other than cordial relations with him. Um, and when the news came out about McCarrick. Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, tonight suspended from his public priestly duties after an allegation he abused a teenager in New York 47 years ago was found to be credible and substantiated. Many members of my parish just speculated, well, he must have known something. He issued a, a memo denying knowing anything, and I defended him until it now has kind of become clear that there must be something he's hiding because why would he have done what he's done to me um, if there weren't something? Um, do you still want to hear this? Sure. Letter? Yeah, okay. Uh, so, to, so to go back, this is the original notice you posted publicly once the McCarrick revelations came out. Exactly. Yeah. Dear Father in God and Brother Priest, I stood holding the processional cross right next to you when you press the crucifix to your lips at the door of St. Matthew's Cathedral. Then we all marched down the aisle and you took possession of the Episcopal throne on January 3rd, 2001. You had no right. On behalf of the priest you ordained, I say to you, you had no right. You had no right to be the one to whom we made our promises. You had no right to be the one to lay your hands on us. You had no right to be the one to give us our first assignments. You had no right to give us advice. You had no right to take advantage of our goodwill and our faith in God and his church. On behalf of the young people you confirmed, I say to you, you had no right. You had no right to be the one to confirm any of them. On the day you put the crucifix to your lips at the door of St. Matthew's, you should have been where you are now. You should have come clean long ago. You did not belong in the TV lights. Your name does not belong on any buildings. You wouldn't live in the truth. Instead, you inflicted upon us this wound, the fact of our archbishop's utter hypocrisy. We have to bear that wound. You had no right but we will get over it. Come clean now. Admit every detail of the truth to God and to everyone you have hurt. Admit the truth, live in it, and be free. Your son and brother, Mark White. I, I, I bet that did not go over well. Yeah, I mean, it made, it made me feel better. Sure. Uh, just to get it Not out Not a there. word of anything in there that A, doesn't need to be said and isn't the stark truth. Right. Yeah, I appreciate your saying that, Michael. Yeah. What, uh, uh, so what was the 
succession of events on you hitting send <laughs> or publish. <laughs> right. Uh, and, I, and just I, so people know, and, and in case your bishop is watching this, which I'm sure at some point he's probably going to be, mm -hmm. uh, you didn't just write that and hit send. I mean, you thought about it, you put some consideration into it. Did you sleep the night before? You did, got up the next morning and looked at it again? Or did you just go like, and hit send? Uh, no, I thought about it long and hard. Um, I mean, I, it, it took me quite a while to, to really put together everything I wanted to say and what I thought I was saying and what I, I know I was saying on behalf of a lot of people that I love. I mean, uh, he, he may, the man may have abused one of the men with, which I, with whom I was ordained. I, the, a couple of my brother ordinands that, of that day have left and I've tried to get in touch with everybody. Uh, just, he never tried to touch me, uh, thank God, but... Um, and I presume probably good for him. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. I wouldn't have taken it too well, that's for sure. Uh, but, the, you know, the, there's one, there's actually two that I couldn't even reach. And they, uh, did they leave the priesthood because of something that he, he tried with them? I mean, we know, I've done a lot of research about this as trying to produce this book that I'm working on, almost finished with. Uh, about what happened up in New Jersey and the, the people that the, the seminarians and priests that he abused. One of them went on to become an abuser himself because that's the way these things go. It's a, it's a cycle of, of evil that is that only the help of the good Lord can overcome. Um, so maybe if we could, I, I kind of want to fast forward to another day and time that was pivotal in the, in the story that has landed me here. And that's when the uh, American bishops went for their every five year visit to uh, the Vatican last fall, just coming up on a year ago. It's right almost exactly a year ago now when they went in the groups to meet with uh, the Pope as, as would be customary. Uh, and it had been over a year since the Vatican had promised some kind of public acknowledgement of how McCarrick had been able to get away with what he got away with for decades. And we'd all been waiting for that disclosure, that honesty, uh, and to no avail. I mean, not a, not a word had been publicly given to us. In the meantime, I had used my blog to gather as much information as I possibly could about this. Uh, and the, the bishops arrived, met with the Pope, Post for selfies with him, with the jerseys of their local NFL teams. Everyone trying to make out as if everything is perfectly fine, as if things are normal and happy in the church. And I, I mean, that day I did not pause before I hit send. <laughs> I should have, because I was livid. I mean, the the we, we you know I think you can relate to this. We. We, we're Catholics, we love the Pope, we, we, we love, we love the, we're loyal to, to what the, the community that is handed on the faith to us. Right, loyal sons of the church, but of our, the church. Exactly, but our, our fidelity has been, to the human institution has been stretched to the breaking point, uh, to the point of, uh, of having consciences that are basically torn in two and where our evangelical enterprise is compromised by the fact that the, 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 the dishonesty, the lack of accountability is apparent to the eyes of the world. Uh, you know, I mean, it, the story that came to mind is, I'm a convert to Catholicism when I was in college, and um, a lot of, and then I decided to become a priest immediately afterwards, and a lot of my family cousins, especially my brother, were very suspicious about this whole thing, that they're not exactly ad, you know, friendly towards the Catholic Church, let's put it that way. But then my, my father died not long after then, um, and I received him into the church just shortly before he died, and then I celebrated his funeral mass. And the, I didn't even realize it would have this effect, but seeing me do the mass and preach one of my cousins said afterwards, you know, Mark, I was afraid that the Catholic Church was a cult, but you're still you. It's not a cult. Uh, you know, I mean, the whole thing had really kind of won her over. And, uh, but now, uh, if, if she said, I want to join the Catholic Church, but 
what about all this dishonesty about the sexual abuse of vulnerable people? What am I supposed to say? How right. am I supposed to answer that? You know, and, and you all deal with the same thing all the time. All and, the time. And, and we, we, need, we need the kind of honesty on the part of the, those who are running the show that we can believe in. Um, we need jail time. <laughs> right. Well, exactly. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, that, I mean, I guess that brings me to the third thing I wanted to bring up that would just hopefully make where I am now and my, how I react to this precept make sense. The, the, our, our neighboring diocese, the diocese that is really a daughter diocese of the Diocese of Richmond, is the Diocese of Wheeling, Charleston, mm -hmm. West Virginia. West Virginia. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and Michael a, a, a fellow associate, I think crony is probably a better word, of McCarrick, um, was, became the bishop of, of that neighboring diocese of ours. Of and there's a whole adults. long story there, but he, he lived the life really of, a, of another McCarrick, uh, spending huge amounts of money, um, putting his seminarians in the same kind of position that McCarrick put his seminarians in. Uh, and and uh, at one point along the line there, a law firm did a, a, a what they thought would be a secret report about Bransfield, uh, which someone involved on the inside became impatient with the way the church officials were dealing with the situation and gave the whole report to the Washington Post. Right. And, the, who, and then the Washington Post published the report in full. And as I was reading through it, I thought to myself, we need lawyers like this to do reports like this in every diocese in the United States, because we we need this kind of accountability. We need the, this culture which still exists. the The culture that allowed McCarrick to do what he did existed the whole subsequent eighteen years while Bransfield was doing it. That that culture needs to change, where where the the authorities push the our obedience to the point where we're not it's not the obedience of a rational human being anymore right, right. I mean, it's it's this kind of subjection that is not christian and and, I, and i'd like you to just for a moment go into that a little bit because some catholics who i believe are probably well-intentioned but overly pious and there is a way to be overly pious. You know, the Catholic life is spent, you know, in tension, not hanging on one side or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of Catholics who are overly pious say, oh, Father shouldn't be talking. You know, Padre Pio accepted all his stuff. He never said anything publicly about it. Oh, the way, you know, you took a vow of obedience. How dare you speak about these things? Uh, uh, I'd, I'd like you to address that mm -hmm. and say, you know, what, what your uh, response is to that kind of, you know, finger pointing at, you know, fathers shouldn't be airing the dirty laundry. Right. I appreciate your asking me about that, Michael. And I guess, I mean, and I appreciate what you said about there's attention. I mean, could we put it on kind of two different extremes here? Like the, when I thought about this kind of question, I have a, a good friend of mine who is a Spanish speaking priest like myself. We were parishes, pastors of neighboring parishes, both with large numbers of Spanish-speaking uh, parishioners. And a few years ago, he was transferred to another parish where there was not a soul who spoke Spanish in the parish. And so, you know, we're thinking to ourselves, this doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. I mean, there's, we, there's not a lot, lot of us going around to do this work. But we took a vow of obedience, right? So you don't think twice. In a situation like that, that, you could call a management consultant company. They could come in and say, this is not a good use of human resources. But that's not the way the priesthood operates. Right. If the bishop says, you go here, you go. Sure. And, uh, and, you just, and so there was there's no question that that's the right thing to do. Right. Then you got another extreme where what if the bishop sent out a memo to all the priests saying, uh, from now on, you don't people who come to church, they don't have to believe that Jesus is the son of God. We, we want to be more welcoming than that. We want to be welcoming to people who maybe don't think that and you have to, that's our new policy now, that's probably <laughs> kind of the unofficial policy actually <laughs> they just haven't put it in writing <laughs> isn't that horrible <laughs> right right well and i mean and, and during the Aryan crisis that's what the kind of thing we were dealing with sure right so but what what pious catholic is going to say well father you, you you took a vow of obedience 
you got to obey that. I mean, that, that doesn't make any sense, right? So, right? so I found myself, I mean, I'm not saying I didn't get a memo that said you have to deny that Jesus yeah, is the Son of God. Yeah. But I found myself somewhere in between that where um, what I was seeing and what I still see is it, 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 it is a criminal, criminally corrupt enterprise underway, right? That, that I, I don't want to be complicit Mm -hmm. in that uh, to be complicit in that is it goes against what we preach and say we believe in and we we say we can be, we can live in the truth and uh, it, for for me to be told that i need to completely shut up if i'm going to continue to have a roof over my head as a priest i mean if, 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 have the basic kind of uh, extortion <laughs> right is uh, to for me to give in to that seems to me like a betrayal of of what every pious catholic believes in um because that is what, what i've been through i mean if i could just tell the story sure. there i mean um it's a long story because it, it began uh, back in, uh, you know shortly after that open letter to, to theodore mccarrick and I, I wrote an open letter to the pope also which maybe i better read just because it in in the interest of full disclosure about how i wound up in the kind of trouble that i'm in the, this this was the, the this was the tipping the, the point. tipping point right, right? so I, this this is from september 1st 2018 it okay. was after the revelations about mccarrick james speaking on on your show and in other venues the pennsylvania grand jury report being published archbishop, archbishop Vig Vigano's Vigano first testimony gave right. his testimony but basically lifting the curtain on everything that had happened right. uh, unknown to us um and to his credit, kind of admitting that he was part of all this. Exactly. Right. right. Okay. So, um, and I think, well, I'll read it, and I, 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 in its own way it speaks for itself. This September 1st, 2018. Your Holiness, I am one of your parish priests. About 414,000 of us labor daily in the vineyard. This summer, the summer of 2018, our church has suffered a public relations catastrophe. It has wounded the hearts of the faithful sons and daughters of the church. We need a father who will seek justice for the victims of sexual abuse. We need an honest father with sound judgment. None of us presume to judge you as the law of our church has it. God alone judges the Pope. But I, for one, beg you establish a procedure for selecting at random parish priests from around the world to take the places of the cardinal electors in the Sistine Chapel, then vacate the chair of Peter. Yours in Christ, Father Mark White. Well, that's uh, it's pretty direct. We, for much the same reason, in Rome, standing in St. Peter's Square, said you should resign. You should resign, Holy Father. Right. Forget about all the dogma and all that stuff and everything. It's old, you know. We're not, you know, we're not cardinals. We're not future popes, but we're laymen in the middle of a scandal right. uh, that uh, is horrendous. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're right. At some point, it becomes dishonest not to say. Well, I presume that went over pretty, pretty well with uh, your right. bishop. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> Yeah. So how yeah. soon did you get the phone call? <laughs> a, few, a few days later. I bet. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I've asked myself. Was it know, a calm voice on the other end? Uh, not exactly. <laughs> not exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, was, it was the secretary to the bishop, who is now the vicar general. Huh. It wasn't the man himself, right. um, which I did object to a little bit. I, he, I, he ordered me to remove the post, which I did do. I, I was obedient then in, in that. Um, I wanted to be at peace with the bishop. I, I mean, I, I have all along. I've asked myself, was I uh, hasty and um, disrespectful in, in publishing that letter? On, on you know, for, to be as clear, I mean, as I can be, on my personal blog, I, I didn't make a big deal out of it. I didn't shove it down my parishioners' throats, any of that. I, it, I didn't seem like that was the right path. I had a blog. It was optional something for people to read as they would choose mm -hmm. but so was i disrespectful i mean I, I wish that in the past two years 
I honestly wish in the, that over the course of the past two years, I had been proved to have been disrespectful. If I had been proved to have been disrespectful by some kind of forthcoming honesty about this whole thing, that I'd, I'd be a happier man than I am now. Right. But it, now it's well over two years of a promise of honesty that we have never gotten. Right. Um, so yeah, so I got the phone call. Uh, uh, it's a long story. I, I'll save some of it for the book, <laughs> right? Uh, but the I I did meet with with the bishop with some friends of mine came with me um, to try to have some kind of compromise. He he issued that precept that I read earlier. He he came and ambushed me after mass with the vicar general and read it to me without giving me a copy of it. Uh, which was I found very odd, um, but again I did obey. I, I turned my blog off completely for about three months. Uh, proposed one compromise after another. Can another? Can I gave a list of priests of the diocese to be my editor, to be my censor. Um, he, he ignored all of those proposals. We we met to meet with. We w went to Richmond to meet with him. Um, and uh, w repeatedly asked, C can we have some kind of clarity about what exactly that I've said that is objectionable? I think you and I have that in common also. Yeah. You <laughs> asked the same question. Sure. And, and uh, I mean, it's a hard truth, certainly, right. that what we talk about, what other faithful Catholics around, uh, certainly on social media, but beyond, talk right. about. Exactly. But so? I'm, right. We have a statue up there in the sanctuary of uh, St. John the Baptist. I mean, those were, I'm sure Herod and Herodias mm -hmm. thought those were our truths too. So right. what? Sure. Yeah. yeah. But but uh, yeah, I, 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 amen to that. But it, it, even if 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 he if I could have gotten an answer to that question, like, can we go over the posts that you don't like? And and if you, uh, uh, with an open mind, I'll take your correction because I he's the bishop, I'm the priest. That's the way these things are supposed to work. But he that too. What he ignored you get the, the all these requests for clarification so I could make corrections uh, did he it, indicate he'd gotten a call from anybody above him yeah I wondered about that I can to this day wonder about that but I, I don't know the answer to that question okay um, anyway to get to the most dramatic part of, of what happened to me uh, the I had taken my blog down at, at, at his order tried to spend months trying to work out these compromises. Next thing you know, coronavirus is upon us. We're not gonna have mass anytime soon. Mm -hmm. the, the, the position of the hierarchy is we need to use the internet as much as we possibly can to communicate with people. Makes sense, right? Guess what? I, uh, this kind of goofball priest over here actually has a blog with a, with a pretty sizable audience already set up that I just turned off because he ordered me to do so. It seems like a good time for me to turn that thing back on. So I wrote him and asked him um, if I could do that and I didn't get an answer. So I just did it. And um, next thing I know, he has written to my parishioners, not to me, written to them behind my back, accusing me of being a schismatic and of publishing scurrilous untruths uh, and a few weeks later the material uh, that you had just read to us he labeled as untrue right yeah and uh, a few weeks later he issued an order removing me as pastor and then a, a week after that he he arrived unannounced to to celebrate a mass that i was prepared to celebrate since my removal order as pastor, according to canon law, does not go into effect until the appeal process, which I had initiated, runs its full course. Mm -hmm. um, he, he didn't want to abide by that. And so he, he, he came and celebrated the mass. He said, you can, can celebrate. And then he stood there talking to the people through the phone, of course, because they weren't there. They were, <laughs> they were at home uh, about me, saying things about me that he had never he and I had never discussed, that I didn't even know what he was talking about. Uh, Were the things he'd said true? Uh, he, he referred to there having been an old wound between he and I. And I honestly, I mean, it may be true because he may have some ill feelings towards me from, from our time in Washington. 
I have no idea what he's talking about. I, I had no idea what he was talking about then. I have no idea what he's talking about now. Um, so then uh, about two weeks after that, he suspended my faculties. And the day after that, he had the locks changed on both parish churches and both rectories. And, Real noble guy. <laughs> uh, it's been rough. Yeah, it is. And how long ago was that? That was in May. So yeah. six months. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I had, I've, I've had a good canon lawyer through this whole thing, and we, we tried to uh, do the appeal process according to law. Yeah. Uh, a, a pastor can only be removed against his will if there was harmful or ineffective ministry. That's what the code says. And my lawyer presented all this evidence about the kind of ministry that I've had. I mean, only the Lord knows in the end. Uh, but, I mean, confirmations, first communions, collections, all that hard data, three, four, five-fold increases of all those things. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, we had this case of this is a wrongful removal. Um, and we got back from the Vatican a... Uh, dismissal of the case on the technicality that the word procurator was not did not appear on page one of the dossier and so there would be no further hearing of this case and even though everything had been filed on time by my lawyer canon lawyer they said since time had gone by since then that there was no further appeal to be uh, uh, put forward so so you're now perma temporarily, permanently on ice. Exactly. That's yeah. it. All right. Let, yeah. let me ask you if you could just conjecture, or perhaps from things you've actually heard, when good faithful Catholics, you former parishioners, or people who know you, uh, you know, who are Catholic, and, and by good faith we mean yeah, they believe the teaching, all of the teachings of the church, they have a good devotional life, an active private devotional life, they go to Mass, all that stuff everything you think of when you think of good, faithful Catholic, unlike Nancy and Joe. Uh, what sort of effect do you think them seeing this kind of treatment for you, as well as other priests, other good priests, what do you think that has on their faith life? Mm -hmm. Just, you know, doesn't, they're not the ones in trouble, so to speak, but they're watching it. Mm -hmm. And they see it in case after case after case of which you're unfortunately just in a one, one only sad group. Mm -hmm. What do you think it has, a, a, what effect do you think it has on their faith lives? I think it's devastating. I know it is because we're talking about people that I've known for years and love and I'm still in touch with. Um, I mean, the, the analogy that I used in my, in my blog to try to understand for myself what had happened to our parishes. I mean, I was a pastor of two parishes and a parish, the life of faith in a parish is, I mean, I'm not a good gardener, right? But it's like being a gardener. Mm -hmm. you, you, you have to cultivate the ground gently over years. And, and, you, and little by little, your rose bushes start to blossom. And then the, the faith that you're talking about, the faith of a Catholic who's, who will go to his or her death holding fast to what we believe mm -hmm. without it, whatever comes, I mean, that's the rose, right? And I'm not saying I'm a good gardener, but I mean, I had labored at it for these years. Um, and what happened was they brought a bulldozer to that garden. That's what they did. They showed up with a bulldozer and bulldozed it. And that's, that is what is left, is a garden with what had been rose bushes torn in tatters by the... Uh, front of a bulldozer. Yeah. Do you have a sense that you touched the beehive? You touched the hive that you should not have touched? I, I do. I can't ha help having that. Um, I, that. Considering what I've been through here, if there weren't something hidden that uh, somebody is gravely afraid of coming out, why would this have happened? Mm -hmm. um, and so I've, I've I, like I said, I mean, I've, I've been trying to write a book about all this, get as much that I know and what about what I've experienced um, 
because I don't want to give up. You know, I, I don't want to. I think you're here. You're doing what you're doing. I, we we need to keep pressing forward to get the truth. Um, and it's going to cost. I mean, it's cost me now. You know, what I thought was the good life that I'd given myself over to the Lord and His Church to to do. I mean, my life has completely changed. I was a happy parish priest with a pretty fruitful little life. Now I am isolated and um, you know having to figure out a way to get by. But uh, I'm not I'm not giving up on what we believe in and the and the way. You know, the, the way that it seems to me the Lord has laid out in front of me is just keep pushing forward, seeking the truth about this apparent network of cronies that are still holding the reins of this enterprise and they need to be held to account for their abuses of power. And Let me, this will be my last question unless you want to uh, add more. Uh, we say famously, I think it disturbs, we'll leave it at that, uh, many members of the hierarchy that we look at the situation here at Church Milton, sort of look over, look over the landscape of the church, the destruction really, and say there's no way this could not, that this could not have come about without too many members of the hierarchy just simply having no supernatural faith. You can have supernatural faith and screw up and make a wrong appointment and let some guy slip through seminary and stuff like that I and mean, everybody makes mistakes. But it seems like there's never any mistakes in the that, that turn out good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it begins to have uh, the sense of an intentionality about it, mm -hmm. uh, and it, you know you can't have that. I mean, you referred to it as we have, you know, as a crime syndicate, mm -hmm. and we'd expand beyond the U.S. to say an international mm -hmm. crime syndicate. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that the heart of the problem uh, with, with all of these, this network of cronies, the crime syndicate issue and everything is at its core a lack of supernatural faith among many members of the hierarchy? Mm -hmm. I think it's an excellent question, Michael. And I, I mean, I would say that the proof is in the pudding, right? I mean, uh, that uh, if uh, the whole way through, I tried to make sense out of what had happened to me with supernatural faith. I, I never doubted that I was validly ordained. Right. Right? Because that's, that's what we believe. We believe that the, the power of the sacraments is greater than the sinful minister. Mm -hmm. And I'm a sinner, I mean, I, and I say valid masses. Right? So <laughs> I, 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 never, I never, that. thank God, because supernatural faith is a gift of grace, uh, I never in, for a second doubted that. What, what, and you still uh, don't. Exactly. You're a right. validly ordained priest, even though McCarrick ordained you. Right. right. But, the, but the question in my mind the whole time I was blogging about this, has always been how do I how do how do I hold that hold on to the faith and deal with the reality of what what this man did and and that other point of view on my ordination day the point of view of the one who had been abused and who was silenced isolated suffering a kind of hell that I can't even imagine while I was having the happiest day of my life right, right. I mean, how how can I deal with that and, and what I come up with is it, I can deal with it by confronting the truth in full because the, the faith gives us the courage to do that right? Right. because we trust in him. He, he's going to see us through. He's got a plan for his church. We don't need to hide anything. So I think you're, what you're saying, the answer is that the, the, the hiding of these ugly truths is the proof that the faith isn't there. Am I making sense? When Absolutely. I yeah. Yeah. I mean, in short, shorthand, you know, you can't do these kinds of things on purpose, willfully, time after time, and still actually believe what the church teaches. Mm -hmm. It's just not possible. Right. Right. Amen. Yeah. Anything else I should have asked you, Father? <laughs> no, I, I appreciate it. It was a really good conversation. Getting yourself in enough trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Father, thank you very much for of being course. here. Of course. Thank you, Michael. It's thank good. you. Very good to talk to you. All right. God bless. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.